Good morning, everybody. So good to see all of your faces this morning. Can I have you all get to your feet? We're going to start praising our God together in his house this morning. He is the lion and the lamb. He's roaring with power. He's fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. So let's proclaim that this morning.
God, who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Father God, we shout out your praise this morning. Lord, you are worthy of all of our praise. God, you are majestic. Lord, you are glorious. You reign with love forever. Lord, there is no one higher than you. We praise you this morning. We thank you for your love, for your mercy that is always upon us. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. We're going to introduce a new song this morning. It's called No One Higher. And uh, when we come into this house every Sunday, into this building, I think a lot of the times we you know we look forward to seeing each other which is important uh, we look forward to singing together to hearing the word being preached um, but I think most importantly we come into this house to glorify our God and to magnify our God and that's the reason why we worship that's the reason why we are here playing instruments and singing this is why you are here singing and so um, let's just lift up the name of God together and proclaim that there's no one higher together there's no one higher than you 
Redeemer, Defender, our great and mighty Savior. There's no one higher than you. You are always with us, gracious to forgive us. By your power we've been set free. And Lord, we stand amazed in your presence. Astounded by your mercy and love. than you. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your promises to us. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. God, we pray that the following time, um, Lord, your presence is here with us, and God, that we open our hearts and our minds and um, prepare ourselves to receive your blessings and to receive your love. We thank you so much. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. You may all be seated and give the following time to Brother Will. you hear me? Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is wonderful to, again, to meet in the house of the Lord. 
As the worship team led us in that song, let the house of the Lord sing praise. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. All those who are here in the house of the Lord, we should be screaming. I was up there singing, and my daughter turns around and tugs on me. She gives me the look. She gives me that look that tells me, Daddy, you're too loud. <laughs> and uh, I, I stoop down a little bit, and I say, honey, we got to worship the Lord with all of our strength, with all of our might. Um, and I, I have to say, I, I, uh, um, I think my range is slightly higher than norm. And so I think the worship team tried to sing at a place where everybody kind of sings at. But for me, I feel like if I sing at that, that key, I, I can't get, oh, man, I can't, I can't get, get, get the praise out. <laughs> so, so I go one octave higher, and then I, my voice is all scratching. But anyways, I want to just proclaim, I let everybody know when we come into the house of the Lord, everybody, oh my goodness, what position we are in. We are in the presence of God. You know, every Sunday we get together, the, the, the service team, we come and pray, and it is our heart's desire that everyone encounters God. We encounter Jesus. When we encounter God, that's what makes this, this gathering different. That's what gives it purpose. That's what gives it meaning. If it is not because of the encountering of Jesus and seeing what he is doing right now presently in my life and our lives, if we do not come face to face with the one who is the light of the world, then nothing, nothing changes. I want to come back and reiterate this year, SVCA, we, we have a calling from the Lord, that it is our desire that the Lord, you would come and bring about change. You would bring about transformation. You would bring about a breakthrough. You would bring about a revival corporately, individually, as families, that God, you would come and bring about a change. And the more and more I reflect upon the word of God, the more I come before the Lord, I say there's no way we can ever change. There's no way about that we would come to a true transformation, a transformation that's intended by God, not just outward formality, without the encountering of Jesus Christ. We must encounter him. We got, we got to spend time with him. So today we're going to continue in the gospel of John. And I pray that this morning, I ask you to pray for me. I, I, I really do pray that this morning that as I'm sharing that it doesn't turn into a teaching session. It really comes and declare on the one hand what God calls us to be. But more importantly, more importantly, far more important than what we need to do, it is to come and to see who Jesus is. And I think when we see, we get a glimpse of his character, his nature, who he is, and to recognize that life, that life, that goodness of God dwells in me. In part, how far I am from the goodness and the mercies of God. But at the same time, to recognize the hope of transformation, the hope of change, the hope for this world, the hope that there would be true, genuine revival is because the goodness of God, the life of God, is in me, is in his church. And so before we begin, I want to just kind of open up and ask this question. And it's probably, I'm not going to ask for show of hands, but how many of you who are here, sitting here, um, you've, uh, you recall a time when something you wanted to keep hidden, maybe your sins or your failures or your past, Something you don't want to be exposed out in the public. And then, bam, is right there when everybody knows. Maybe not everybody, but in a situation where you've done something wrong and it was found out. I see some nodding of heads, and most of you are not very responsive. Either you don't want me to know, or you guys are all really, really good. Uh, but there's been a number of times in my life uh, where what I've done, and my failures, uh, my mistakes, uh, was made known. Um, 
in retrospect and looking back and when we come to look at this particular story, I, I really want to say, God, I thank you. It was not an easy process. It was actually a very painful process. Um, but when the Lord does that, he does it with a purpose. He does it for the purpose of redemption and salvation. He does it with a purpose of change and transformation. You know, Pastor, you always said he keeps sharing and keeps sharing. And I don't know all of us who's been at this church for so many years, we picked up on it. Whatever God desires and wants out of our lives is what he wants to give us. We go through this process of recognizing the standards of God. What God desires out of our lives, out of his church, that standard does not change. That standard remains. For the purpose that we would come to the place of recognizing and knowing, I am so far from that standard. The way God wants me to love, the way God wants me to forgive, I am nowhere close to it. The holiness that he desires in my life, I'm not even, an in, I'm, I cannot even describe how far I am from his intentions. And then when we come to realize, God, I don't have anything. I don't know if you guys recall, that's the time that we humble ourselves enough to come to the Lord and say, God, I need you. I need you because I don't have any of it. So I want to say that this is kind of the backdrop of the verses that we're going to read today, the story that we're going to come to today. So if you have your Bibles, can you turn to John chapter 8? We're going to look from verse 2 to verse 11. I think this is a story that is familiar to many of you. Uh, I, I, I hope that it is not the, the first time you come across it, but it is a wonderful, wonderful story, and it's a wonderful, wonderful event that is recorded, I think, obviously, for our purpose, for our understanding of the heart and the mind of Jesus Christ. So again, just so everybody understand, Jesus is coming to the very last day of the Feast of Tabernacle. This is the very last feast of the Tabernacle that Jesus will celebrate on earth. In about six months' time, Jesus is going to go up on the cross. For about three years, Jesus has walked through the land of Israel both in Judea and Galilee, he's spoken, he's performed works of wonder, miracles. And one interesting thing that has been very, 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 very visible is that the character and the personhood of Jesus Christ, somehow, somehow, those who are deemed as sinners, those who were the outcasts of that society, those whom people despise, particularly the group who are religious, who believe that they are followers of God, who walks very uprightly, very in a very uh, uh, hold themselves to very high standards. The group of people that they despise, maybe even society looks down upon them. This is the group of people that is drawn to Jesus. And when they come to Jesus, they find that they are not cast away. They're accepted. It almost seems as if Jesus comes as the defender. As the friend of sinners. That's what the scripture says. It's become very, very evident. And so, as Jesus comes in display, and we'll talk about this a little more, the heart of God for restoration, for salvation. That's why he came. That was his personhood. That's his message. And so now, among those who think that they walk uprightly, now there is a distinct hatred a distinct a sense of, wait a minute, what is the matter with this man? It almost seems as if this man is perverting our traditions, our laws, the things that have been handed down to us for thousands and thousands of years by our forefathers, that these are the things that you need to walk before the Lord God, and that these are the things that you need to practice and uphold. It seems as if Jesus doesn't care. And so we come to the story. Jesus' ministry, what he has done, is evident throughout that time, throughout that land. And you need to recognize one thing that is amazing. That is amazing. 
that those whom the righteous, those who think that they're righteous, despise, those group of people, they run to him. They are drawn to him. I want to tell you, I want to say this to you. I want to say this to the church of God. It is a time, it is a season. We are in a time where the church of God needs to come and recognize the character, the personhood of Jesus Christ. I don't, I, I, I'm hesitant to say this, but there is no time like our time that we as followers of Jesus Christ, we as the church of God, needs to come and see the heart of Jesus Christ. I want to let everybody know, before I continue, that when Jesus came into this world, the holiness of God, the standards of God, the righteousness of God, the justice of God has never, ever been compromised. Never, ever been compromised. But when we come and read this story today, maybe some of you will be scratching your heads and say, what is going on? So let's come to the word, uh, the word of God today. Uh, John chapter 8, verse 2 through 11. Let me read through the story for everyone, and then we'll come back. We'll look at them verse by verse. It says, now early in the morning, Jesus came again into the temple. Again, this is the last day of the feast. And all the people came to him. And he sat down and taught them. So this is a very intimate setting, an intimate place. I would say it's more intimate this moment of me standing here preaching, me here sharing with you. You, you can imagine it's kind of like a Friday night small group fellowship at somebody's home coming together. Maybe not to that extent, but Jesus is coming to the place of intimacy. People are drawn to him, coming to listen, to listen to this teacher. And then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commended us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? You know, the translation is, what do you say of her? What is your verdict for her? And again, I want to bring everybody a setting. Sometimes when we read scripture, we read the story, we just go by. We got to think about this. The setting, again, this is the place of intimacy. This is the place where the Lord's sitting down. He's not standing up preaching. He's talking with those who are drawn to him. And then at that moment, somebody comes, a group of people comes and drags this woman in the midst and casts her right there, standing alone, where everybody now sees her. Everybody's eyes on her. Everybody stops listening. Everybody's watching. And they now challenge you, Jesus, teacher. They say Jesus. They say teacher, the one who teaches the laws of God, the ways of the Lord. Teacher, you know the law. This woman was caught. In the middle of adultery, the very act, Moses says, we need to stone her to death. What do you say? Dear ones, I opened up with the question, have you ever encountered a situation? Maybe not to this drastic. But can you imagine, at this very moment, at this very moment, your, your darkest secrets, the things that you don't want anybody to know, the things that you do when no one's watching, now all of a sudden is being played on this television. It's right here. It's being broadcast. I want you to understand, on the one hand, where this woman resides at this very moment. And on the one hand, what these men were trying to do. And on the one hand... Jesus at that very spot. The story goes on. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his fingers as though he did not hear them or they did not hear. So when they continue asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience 
went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the least. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, still there, not moving, didn't go anywhere. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I could have gone a little further today, but I wanted to just end at those verses and come and look at this whole story, how everything begins to unfold. I know we, we know the heart of Jesus. We, we look at Jesus. We, the one thing for those of us who've been saved, who's been on this side of the cross, on this side of the salvation, who's come under the shadow of the cross, Every single one of us, we know, we know intimately when we speak of Jesus, he is the one who saves me. He's the one who rescued me. He's the one who did not condemn me. He's the one that restored me. I pray that everyone who is in this room, I pray that all those who will be watching, that there will be a moment where you will come to know Jesus in such a way. You will encounter Jesus in such a way, particularly when you come to know of the extent of your sins. But this morning as we see the story, this woman now was thrust in the midst of everyone. And these scribes and Pharisees, they come and they stand on the grounds of the law. And they said... Teacher, the one who knows the law well, what should we do about her? Teacher, you know what Moses commanded us to do. What is it that we should do? Before I walk into what Jesus has done, I come across this verse where God sums up the totality of the law. In Malachi chapter uh, 6, verse 8, it says, um, I don't want to misquote it. He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Run, sisters, I didn't put this down as the memorization verse for this Sunday, as a different verse. But this is a verse that we all need to keep within our hearts. The totality of the law is summed up in Malachi. God says, I want you to do justly. I want you to love mercy. I want you to walk humbly with God. So we want to come and look at this. The notion, the intention at the opening of the story is that on the surface, these men want to execute justice. But we're going to talk about they really was not going after justice. They really was not going after equity. They were not going after fairness. But before we come and step into the extent of God's mercy, the extent of Jesus' mercy and his forgiveness, we all need to come and understand what this woman has done. The scripture said that she's committed adultery. Friends, sister, I don't know when you are sitting here, you're listening. Friends, if you're listening, the notion of adultery, where does that weight, where does that sit with you? Among the sins that the scripture calls sin, where does it recognize? What is, what is fair, the appropriate retribution for adultery? These men that brought this woman to Jesus, they were right. Moses gave the commandment, and it's actually not Moses' commandment. God gave the edict that adulterers, those who commit adultery, you are to bring them into a public place, and you are to stone them to death. Dear ones, the concept 
And I want, I want to understand, everybody, we live in a time and we live in a culture where we see those whom we admire, maybe on television screens, those who are in the front of us, the notion, the concept of adultery, the concept of having an affair, nobody likes it. Nobody thinks it's good. Nobody wants it. But nobody, I don't think in our time, would treat adultery with this degree of severity. But in the eyes of God, this is a capital offense. This is an offense that requires the life of those who committed adultery. I want to let you know there are a couple of reasons why. Why the Lord institute this. And by the way, I want to let everybody know very, very clearly. When the Lord instituted what we deem punishment, it is not for the sake of punishment. It is for the sake of equity. Fairness. The Lord made it very clear in his command. You will not render a punishment or a judgment on someone beyond what that offense is worthy of. If a person can only be spanked once, you don't spank him twice. If he's to be ridiculed in private, you don't ridicule him in public. That is the standard of our God. That is the heart of our God. But the reason why adultery is a capital offense in the eyes of God, that offense has committed murder. You've killed You've killed. You have killed the heart of your spouse. You have destroyed. You have killed the heart of your children. You have forever, without the grace of God, altered the lives of so many people. The brokenness that it brings is not just you. It is not just the person of whom you've offended. It impacted the society as a whole. God's eyes on adultery, he takes it very seriously. But those of you who are familiar with scripture, you see why God uses this relationship a marriage relationship, why God holds us so dearly to his heart. We had a single seminar yesterday, and Pastor Nancy opened, not with just telling everybody what to do, what not to do in the dating relationship. The seminar opened with the very foundation of why we need to understand we get into courtship. It's to understand God's heart and God's design and God's picture for marriage. God intended for that. God hates that marriage to be destroyed. And the scripture tells us that marriage is a reflection. It is a reflection of a great mystery, a significant mystery, a relationship between God and his people, between Christ and his church. It reflects that intimacy, the intimacy between God and his people. And when someone commits adultery, God uses that and God says, my people, when you have departed from me, when you go after something else, when you go after another cistern, when you go after another fountain that is not me, you run after another love, another God, you have committed adultery against me. You committed adultery against me. Brothers and sisters, I, you need to understand the severity of the background of this story. And I want to let you know, not an ounce of Jesus misinterpret that understanding, that notion. Jesus did not undercut the severity of the sin. He did not just turn an eye and say, I won't look at it. I won't remember it. I won't see it as if it didn't happen. 
that would be inconsistent with his nature, that would be inconsistent with who he is. God is absolutely just, absolutely righteous, absolutely merciful. He will not render those who have sinned as if they have not sinned. It is clear in his eyes. So Jesus knew. Jesus knew what this woman had done. Jesus knew the consequences of her action. Jesus knew. But the issue at hand was not an issue of equity, an issue of fairness. The issue at hand, as you read in the passage, these men that brought her before Jesus and asked the teacher, teacher, what would you do with her? Their very purpose was to put Jesus in a bind. Their very purpose was to trap him. What were they trying to do? I want to ask you guys, I don't know, perhaps it's very clear with you guys and with everybody. How did these men catch her in the very act? How did these men catch her in the very act? I sat there and I thought about it and I said, well, I don't know if this was a setup. I don't know if this was prearranged. And by the way, where was the guy? They brought the woman, where was the guy? Moses actually said, you bring both of them. You bring both of them. Both of them are to be executed. Where was the guy? This whole process wasn't about justice. It wasn't about fairness. It wasn't about restoring the sanctity of our society to let people know what this is wrong. It's all about one thing, to now put Jesus on the spot. Jesus, if you say let her go, then everyone who is here listening to you As a teacher here in the house of the Lord, they will know that you will not obey the laws of God. You defy Moses. You defy our traditions. You will not adhere to what is righteous. And if Jesus says, execute her, the Romans would come down on him. The Jews has no right for capital punishment in those days. And then if Jesus says, fine, go ahead, do what Moses said. What he has done for three years, what people have known of him, who is the friend of sinners, those who are drawn near to him, all of a sudden, probably would lose their interest, lose their trust, lose their understanding of what this man is trying to do. Friend, sister, what is Jesus to do? Well, you know what Jesus did because the verses goes on and tells us. But at that, if you were there in that predicament, what would you do? What would you do? You know the intentions. I, I tell you, dear ones, we live in a time We live in a day, we live in a season where, oh my goodness, we have to be careful with what we say. I I keep praying, I tell you, that every time I stand up here, I say, God, you, you grant me the faithfulness, the courage to say the things that you place on my heart to say. And I want to be, be, be true to your word. There may be those who aren't in the house of the Lord that will listen to the message and immediately hear something totally different. You you know what I'm talking about. What you say and what you do, you probably be 
hated and judged by 50% of our world today. You can't please everybody. You feel like you're between a rock and a hard place. But that's what's so amazing about Jesus. The more I come and look at our Savior, the more I look at Jesus. The scripture says that Jesus, he is full of grace and he's full of truth. I tell you, dear ones, it's hard for me to comprehend that. It's hard for me to wrap it around my head sometimes. How does grace and truth come? And, and they are so intertwined, so well, so nicely fitted together. As if you can't split them apart. You can't say, oh, he's op- Jesus is operating in grace. Jesus is operating in truth. Whatever he is doing, grace and truth, they are, they are placed together as if I cannot distinguish the two. That is what's so amazing about Jesus. Dear ones, this morning I pray that as you listen to the story, you come to look at your Jesus, to look at your Lord and Savior. How amazing he is. He knows intimately what this woman has done. Now he's placed with a challenge. He knows it's a group of people. They had no intention for righteousness. There is no intention of bringing equity into the situation. And so Jesus said to them, they were testing him. And Jesus pretended like he didn't hear them at all. And you see the story as Jesus began to get down and starts to scribble. And he's going to start scribbling on the ground. And everybody's kind of like, what in the world is he doing? And they keep pestering him. Teacher, what do you say? Hey, we're still here. What are you going to do? Teacher, what do you say? Hey, we're right here. What are you going to do about this? And he's scribbling on the ground. And after this continue, what are we going to do? What are you going to do, teacher? What do you say? Hello, what do you say about her? Jesus gets up, and Jesus says, and Jesus said, he who is without sin, you go ahead and cast the first stone. He who is without sin, you get up, and you throw the first stone. You cast the first stone, and then Jesus got back on the ground, And he started writing. This is the story. This is the place. And my notes, at least for me, where mercy began. Jesus has done something amazing here. A lot of times we think that it is just for the woman. We fail to recognize at this very moment, there's a far greater miracle that took place. Scripture tells us one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they dropped their stone and they walked away. You need to come and recognize in this particular story, in this situation, the mindset that these men were in. I don't know how many of you have been in an argument and you're in a heated argument. In the middle of that argument, part of you know that what the other side is saying is right. But you keep arguing. You don't give your ground. I'm not losing this one. How difficult, just you picture, is it for you to drop the issue and walk away? But what Jesus said, the light of the world, the light of the world, He said, all of you who come, you're putting me on the spot. I know you're doing this. I know you're doing this. I know you're using this woman as an example. If you feel like you are without sin, if you are perfect, go ahead and cast the first stone. Dear ones, I... I, when, when I read this, I stayed here for a while. I said, why would Jesus say this and do this? Because according to Mosaic law, the condition for those who would cast the stone is not that they would be without sin. Moses never said when you find someone or those who are adulterers, when they're, when they're found out, 
that only those who are perfect, only those who are without sin, you come and you execute judgment. They didn't say that. The law didn't say that. But Jesus gave this condition and says, those of you who are without sin, you guys go ahead and cast the first stone. And he got down on the ground, and then he started writing and scribbling again. Jesus is doing something where he's not writing away the requirements of the law. He's doing a miracle not just for this woman. He done something far bigger than just this woman. All these men were convicted of their sins. Dear ones, all of these men were convicted of their sins. I don't know if it's just the sins that they've committed, they recognize that I have not sinned, or at the very moment they recognize what we are doing here is deceptive. This man saw right into our hearts. Something inside of them began to burn. I don't know what happened to these men. But brothers and sisters, when I came to the story, a lot of time we focus, we say it's about this woman. This woman and Jesus. This thing went beyond her. Jesus performed a miracle. What Jesus said, done something amazing. He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. I also want to say this, just so that no one is confused. We say that Jesus is absolutely righteous. He is just. But I want to let you know, I want to let you know very clearly, when Jesus came into this world, 33 and a half years, he came with a very specific purpose. He knew exactly what the Father sent him to do. He knew exactly what the Father sent him to do. He says, whatever the Father shows me, that's what I did. Whatever the Father told me to say, that's what I said. I did not do anything of my own initiative. But and sister, you guys all know the, the, the Christmas story when Jesus was born. You know that time, the name that was given to Jesus. He's called. He's going to be called Emmanuel. God with us. A holy God. Sinful man who cannot come close, who cannot draw near. The, throughout the entire Old Testament, the heart of God burns and yearns to be with his people. He finds a way. He creates a tabernacle, which is a type of Jesus Christ. He provided a way where people can come into his presence. He loved his people. And just so you know, his love for Israel is not just Israel alone. He really, truly loved the whole world. He wanted the whole world through Israel to be saved. He wanted every nation to come and look at Israel and say, what a wonderful God you have. And they would turn, but Israel failed. This is the God who desires to dwell in the tabernacle among his people. And he could not. It, um, <laughs> Aaron. Luke and I, this morning, we were reading. And again, the Lord was showing me throughout. We came to 2 Kings. And he oftentimes comes and asks me, Daddy, man, none of these kings, one by one, very few did what was right in the sight of the Lord. How many years has gone by? Oh, the heart of God yearns and burns. And then, in the fullness of time, when the age and the dispensation of the law was enough, where God shows his people, you will not be able to meet my standards. By your own efforts, you will never attain to the righteousness of the law. Even though you keep trying, you keep trying, you keep trying, the very evident that I cannot be with you, it is because holiness does not exist among the hearts of men. It cannot happen. So when the dispensation of the law was done, now Jesus ushers in a new dispensation. 
he brings in grace. His name is called Emmanuel. God now with us. I am now right here with you. I am among you. You shall call his name Jesus, Joshua, Yeshua, because he will deliver his people out of their sins. The name Joshua just simply means God saves. But we got a clear understanding. The name, the reason why he is called Jesus is because he will deliver his people out of their sins. Jesus' ministry is unfolded in John chapter 3, verse 16 and verse 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus' ministry, Jesus' work when he came, he came to accomplish the work of redemption, the work of salvation. He did not come to condemn. He could have. He could have. In his second coming, he will come in his righteousness. But in this dispensation of grace, he comes to do one thing and one work, the work of redemption and salvation. He did not come to condemn. Brother and sister, Jesus could very, very well, very, very easily, when these men came and brought this woman to her and say, what, what do you say of her? Jesus could have very easily said, go get the other guy, bring them in, Stone them both to death. He would have fulfilled the law. He could have done that. That could have been one of the outcomes. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that because the work that the Father sent him to do was not to condemn. It did not lower the standards of God. It came about the way that God now is going to bring us into salvation. You need to recognize this. You need to realize this. It is not that Jesus is saying this is not important. The sin is not important. But Jesus came to do a very specific work, the work of salvation and redemption. I could go through more and more illustrations. The same reason why Jesus had the dialogue with uh, the woman that was not Jewish, when she came praying and asking Jesus, Jesus says, shall I give bread to the dogs? She, Jesus not calling her a dog. But Jesus being very, very distinct. Jesus says, my ministry, when I come, it is to the nation of Israel. It starts right here. He knows the purpose. He knows exactly what he's doing. And in this same context, you understand what Christ is doing. He's bringing about salvation. So now, one by one, they drop their stones. They all walked away. There are other more notes that I'm going to skip today, but there is biblical reference, the reason why if one of these men says, wait a minute, that's not what the law said. The law didn't say, if I am without sin, then I'm able to cast a stone. The law says, you judge them, that's it. One of these men could have, could have got up and said, no, I'm not going to listen to you. So on the one hand, the Holy Spirit convicted of all their hearts. But Moses also prescribed in the law that if there's something that is too difficult for you to understand, something that is too difficult for you to judge, for you to decide, you will go to my house, you will go to the judge at the time, you will go to that teacher, and you will ask that person, what shall we do? And when you have asked that person, what shall we do? And whatever that person tells you, whatever that judge, whatever that priest, whatever that teacher tells you to do, you adhere to what he says. If you act presumptuously and say, I will not do what he says, you guys know what the consequence is? You have to be put to death. <laughs> Let 
I'm so sorry, guys. I, I feel like I, uh, I don't know how to illustrate Jesus more beautifully. I don't know how to illustrate him in such a way that you, you really see how amazing is Jesus. He, he's not simply a lawyer that knows the law back and forth. He's not simply one that knows what I can get away with, what I can't get away with. He's not the one that navigates around through the lanes and through the words. He understands the wisdom, the Spirit of God at that very moment, how to respond in such a way that turns the whole situation around. Would you let Jesus come into the situation that looks dire, that looks impossible, and you let Jesus come and turn things around? Would you let Jesus come in and turn things around? Because man's way, man's ways are ruthless. Man's way do not avail to the things of God. But just, I want to say this, we are in a time, it seems that there's a great divide in the house of God. And I will say this again. I absolutely stand for the protection of the unborn. There are a lot of things that our time and our culture is going through an argument in society. But I will tell you, laws and policies, I'm not saying they're wrong, but they don't change people. If our hope for a better society of our hope for a better world, of our hope for a better place, of our hope for people is hung upon those whom we elect to change the laws of this land. It will not change people. It's very evident. This nation has become more and more divided. So I will say, Church of God, brothers and sisters, it is a time and a season where we need to come and look at Jesus. You don't need to compromise. We don't need to compromise the standards and the righteousness, the holiness, the things of God. But what I want to say is the things of God cannot be accomplished through the means of men. It cannot. It won't work. Even if our intention is right and we want to bring equity and justice. We got to let Jesus in. We got to let Jesus in our lives. We got to allow Jesus to live through our lives. We got to allow Jesus to impact our world. We got to bring people to Christ. We bring the love, we bring Jesus to them. That's what changes. That's what truly changes. This is what Pastor Yu is talking about. It's not just the outward changes, he's talking about true transformation. You know, the scary thing about our time is you could be talking to somebody. And that person may be very cordial with you. But you cannot read what is in the intent of that person's mind. Because we are in a time where we're so sensitive about what is being said. We worry. We are politically correct. And I will say in that regard, you don't really know what is the intention of the person you're talking to. Until you really begin to have a dialogue. And my point is this, let Jesus in. Jesus needs to take a hold of us. Jesus needs to take a hold of this world. And so when these men, they've all walked away. These men all walked away. And it's now that woman, notice she's still in the midst. She's still standing right there. She didn't move. I don't know if she was terrified. I don't know if she was waiting she was terrified of the stones coming. I don't know if she was crouched down and she dared not look. I know, I'm almost certain she's not boldly looking at every one of them. I know she's probably covered in shame. She knows what she has done. She knows she's been found out. And she's waiting for the stones to land. And then she hears, she hears the sound one by one. The stones dropping. And one by one, these men begin to walk away. And then there was just dead silence. And then the voice comes. 
Brothers and sisters, you need to encounter Jesus this way. You need to encounter that voice. The voice comes and says, woman, where are all your accusers? Is anyone left? She, she picked up her head. She looked. They're all gone. There's nobody here. She said to Jesus, no one. No one except, except one. Except one. And this one has every right to judge. I see no one, but I only see you, Jesus. And Jesus says to her, I will not condemn you. A lot of people end the story right here. Jesus says, I will not condemn you. But Jesus says to her, go and sin no more. Some people think that's an edict. You've been caught. You made a mistake. I just bailed you out. Don't do it again. Now go. I was not Jesus. Our Jesus' love and his mercy, his tenderness now has, I believe, I hope, transformed her. You now possess what you did not have before. It's not a fear. It's not a fear of the consequences of the sin. You have something that you did not have before. When I say to you, go and sin no more, you now have forgiveness and love. I love Sir Isaac's uh, amazing Grace. You guys all know that song. There's one verse that when I was growing up, I, you know, you, you sing these hymns and it goes through it. But no, there was this one verse, the one line that caught my heart. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. And then fear, grace, relief. The grace of God, the mercies of God now taught me, oh my goodness, I did not get what was supposed to come to me. He did not render unto me what was due to me. He forgave me. He saved me. He yanked me out from all those who wanted my life. He restored me. Friends and sisters, if you are still in the place of struggling, of saying, I will not, I don't want to, I cannot go back to doing the same sin again. I'm not telling you that you just lie there and say, God, you do whatever. There are things you need to cut off from your life. If you're stuck on pornography, you got you to gotta have tangible actions to cut those things off in your life. But I want to tell you this. Out of personal experience, the only thing that enabled me to live away from sin is when I come intimately to know the cross. How much he loves me. And this is the same reason, brothers and sisters, when we come to communion, I ask every one of you. I was growing up when I was young, and I have, brothers and sisters, I think the intent and the teaching, the intent was that we have the right heart. And the, 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 the notion was, if you come to the Lord and you do not have the right attitude or you just committed some sin, again, non-repentant, we still say the same thing. You're unworthy. You drink to your own judgment. But some bread and sister, when the bread and the cup has come and come to them and they handle it and they pass it on. When I started to serve the bread and the cup, I would come across a row. I would serve brothers and sisters the bread and the cup. And there's some individual that I know that they're saved. I know they're baptized. They take the bread of cup and they would pass it on. I'm not at a place of condemnation or judgment. But this is sorrow in my heart. Because the intent of communion, the intent of this bread and this cup, Jesus is saying, 
Make it right. Make it right right now. My forgiveness, my grace is now. At this very moment, you get right with me right now. Friends, this is not by your effort. It's not by your strength. I want to say every time you stumble, every time you sin, even if it was Saturday night and Sunday morning you have to come, and Eunice comes up here and say, the house of the Lord is to sing praise. He said, well, you don't know what I did last night. You don't know. If you were there with me, you would probably tell me to be quiet this morning. Brothers and sisters, it's the moment of the heart that you turn to Christ. Look, he's the only one that stands there. And he's the one that is saying, I will not condemn you. I pray it is the grace of God that propels you to say, Jesus, how amazing is your love. I don't want to go there anymore. I don't need to go there anymore. I found my satisfaction in you. I found love. I found what this world could not give. I found what truly satisfied. The only one who truly accepted me, embraced me, loved me. Dear ones, the church of God, we need to refresh us again and again and again with the love of God. You need to. Maybe you've forgotten. Maybe you think the story, it just has something to do with that woman. Maybe you think the story is just someone else. Maybe you think, I'm okay. Oh, how the Holy Spirit open our eyes that we may see. We need to encounter the mercy and the grace of Jesus. We will now walk humbly with our God. Well, Jesus, I want to thank you this morning. I know these words are not of me. But Lord, Holy Spirit, we pray that you continue to minister into each and every one of our lives. Lord, I want to pray that you sustain me. Sustain me in such a way that the cross is always before me. Oh, Lord, that I will never, ever try to run this race in my own strength. Father God, this morning, I want to pray for all of my brothers and sisters. I want to pray for those who have not yet come under the saving grace of Jesus Christ. That this morning, oh, Lord, the only one who can condemn, he does not condemn. He does not condemn. He comes to save. He comes to save and to change and to transform us from the inside out. Lord Jesus, may you receive the highest praise, the greatest glory. And when we come to your table now, Spirit of God, lead us into the love of Christ. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. two words that um, stood out to me from Will's message are the words, Jesus knew. And I think that's something that we all desire. Um, Kevin actually talked about this at Youth Retreat, is that all we want is to be known and to be understood. Um, and Jesus knows us. He understands us. He knows all of our sin and all of our weaknesses, all of our pain, all of our joys. Um, and despite all of the things about us that we hide from him, he knows it all or try to hide. He knows it all. And we talked about the Samaritan woman a couple of weeks ago. Um, and she says, he told me everything I ever did. And to have someone know you that fully, the God who created you to know you that fully, I think is a very humbling and beautiful thing. And that's, um, that's something that's been running through my mind. He knows all of, all of our issues and all of our sin but he still saves us and he still loves us. Um, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is from Ephesians 2. I'll read it for you all now. I'm sorry I didn't provide it earlier for the slides, but uh, Ephesians 2 says, uh, verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Those two words, but God, they always, always, always strike me. Um, every time I read them, all of these things that we bring to him that are seemingly insignificant, 
Um, but God, he loves us, he saves us, he died for us. So we're going to take some time uh, to come before the table. Uh, we're going to um, sing and we're going to pray. Um, if the spirit moves you to pray out loud, please do so. Um, if you need to kneel, if you need to sit, if you need to stand, please come before the Lord. Um, and uh, we're going to thank him for what he's done for us. my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness
so that we do not need to take on the punishment that we deserve because you redeem us. You took upon the punish punishment on upon, upon yourself so that we can be saved and redeemed and restored. Lord, thank you for your life. Thank you for saving us. So we come to you, Lord. We humble ourselves to you. We say, Lord, you are our Lord. We commit ourselves to you. We bow before you. We give our lives to you. We honor you as the Lord of our lives. We praise you and worship you. And you only, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. Lord, you and you alone, your love alone, your love alone can break us from the cycle of sin. You and you alone. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that this morning, Holy Spirit, you once again bring us to the cross. Holy Spirit, you bring us into intimacy with our Lord and Savior. Oh, Lord, that our eyes would, would lock eyes with our Jesus. Oh, Lord, I pray. I pray that you would silence the accuser. Oh, Lord, this morning, anyone, oh, Lord, who is under the weight of condemnation, oh, Lord Jesus, you would silence the voice of the accuser. Lord Jesus, you would bring us into your forgiveness, into your freedom, into your salvation, into your restoration, into your resurrection. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would bless this bread, bless this cup. And Lord, you come and stir every one of our hearts right towards you. We thank you, God. We praise you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, sister, I want to continue to invite you and encourage you. Open up your hearts, open up your mouth and praise. Even as to the degree that only you can hear, but open it up in praise and thanksgiving to Jesus. And then I want to ask everyone, again, if you're not baptized yet, as, you, uh, as we come and partake of this bread and drink this cup, we pray that you will withhold that time until you commit your life, give your life to Jesus Christ, until you're baptized in his name, recognizing what he has done for you, the significance of this bread and of this cup, and again, I want to encourage everyone, dear ones, come examine your heart. Examine yourselves as the scripture calls us to do. If there's any area that's not pleasing to the Lord, come, turn from it. Surrender your life to Jesus. Give yourself to him.
you come? Come to the Lord's table. Come to his invitation. Exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory. Sisters, let's take the bread and the cup together. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your bread and your cup. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your life. Thank you for your salvation. Lord, always bring us to the cross. Help us to see all the sacrifice you have done for us. And that's where we will renew our strength. That's where we will be strengthened. That's where we can live out your life. And Lord, I pray that you continue to lead us as this week starts. 
Help us to continue to come back to you. We thank you, and this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. We are going to close today just by singing No One Higher again. We're going to proclaim the words together. Um, I think this song has, um, it's such a great reminder um, that we are coming before a God of mercy, a God of love, um, as we'll share today. Um, God's mercy triumphs over judgment. So can I have you all stand? And we're going to sing this song together. together there's no one higher than you redeemer defender our great and mighty savior there's no one higher than you you are always with us gracious to
Lord, we thank you for there is no one higher. God, there is no one greater, no one like our God. God, there is no one like you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for pouring out your love and your mercy upon us. God, we thank you for your presence that is always with us. Emmanuel, we praise you. We thank you. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. You may all be seated. It was such a blessing to worship with you all this morning. I just have a couple of announcements for us. Um, the first one is that we are having a night market uh, event, which is uh, in, I guess, we're combining with the CM side. So Fuse is putting this on. Um, it's our English and Chinese ministries. Uh, it's put on by the young adults, but all the small groups are participating. Um, and so there will be tables in the cafeteria. There will be like little booths set up. Uh, it's going to be a fundraiser for Bethel Hall, our new sanctuary that we are um, building. So come hungry, leave in press. I think it's a great slogan. Uh, if you want to participate, please reach out um, to your small group leader um, to either register to uh, prepare a booth or cook um, or uh, register RSVP to attend. So tickets are going to be sold at the entrance uh, the night of, um, cash or Venmo, that all works. So um, don't worry about that. And then if you need to, um, if you want to sign up, and brainstorm, please do so before it's too late because there's a lot of great dishes and you should all get involved. It's going to be awesome. Um, there's also going to be a little time of worship afterwards, so um, it's going to be from 6.30 to 9 on July 21st. Uh, the next one is that we are still doing our life groups. They started on June 25th, uh, but it's not too late to sign up. Uh, these are the groups that are being led um, by our lovely people in the EM ministry. Uh, the Chosen Watch Party happens every Friday, um, followed by the Radical Book Study which is here. There's a workout life group that's led by Eric at his house. Uh, so if you want to work out and get swole, you know, we're halfway through July, but it's never too late. Um, go talk to Eric. Uh, there's a young family play dates life group. Um, and then there's a food bank life group. And I believe the first event for that is this coming Saturday, right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so please get involved if you would like to do that. The next announcement is we have a fellowship lunch after combined service on July 30th. Um, it's an opportunity for us to get to know each other. If there's newcomers, um, they come, they get to eat for free. Um, and if you are not a newcomer, we would like to ask you to please uh, offer $13. Um, per person, and then, uh, that, so that will happen after combined service, and it will be in that room back there uh, where Luke is standing. Luke, say hi. There you go. Um, so fellowship lunch will be in that room. And then last but not least, our Labor Day conference is coming up. This is every Labor Day in this building um, from Friday through Sunday. So you all get Labor Day off. You get Monday off, which is great. Um, but it is an amazing and uh, much anticipated time every single year. Um, and I would like to ask us all to or start and continue to pray uh, for Labor Day Conference. Um, the theme continuing from last year is transformation and breakthrough. Um, and then this year's theme is come let us rise up and build from Psalm 87. There's a, likely, uh, a nice little banner that's designed. And then uh, to register, there's a, that's a QR code. Oh, it looks weird. All right, well, that's the QR code to register. Um, and it will be from September 1st to September 3rd. And we have a bunch of speakers coming. Um, so please register for that uh, if you're interested. But that is all I have for announcements. Have a great Sunday. Much love. Peace. <laughs>